Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. Alright, we are looking at Watsuji Tetsuro's Ethics Rinrigaku. We're moving into part 3, the spatio-temporal structure of a human being. And in this video we'll look at the first two chapters in this part, chapters 8 and 9. So the first chapter, chapter 8, Private and Public Existence. So private and public existence are basically different aspects or different ways of thinking about individual and community, which we've already looked at, right? So both of these public and private existence are the negation of the other. That's what they, that's how they arise. Private existence is the negation of public existence. Public existence is the negation of private existence. And we are both. We have, we exist in both of these modes, if you like, um, at the same time, in the same way that we saw we are both an individual and a community, and the way that those negations kind of played off each other. So the meaning of public existence, then, that's the first, our first stopping point. What, is it, what does public existence mean? Um, the meaning of public existence is for something to be revealed. Something to be disclosed is another word that Watsuji uses. So that's the first important word here, revelation. Um, and that's what it is for um, something to have public existence. And he, he wonders about what, how far can this, this notion of public existence be extended? <clears throat> can we talk about international publicity, for example? Um, and he says, no, we can't. We can't go that far because at that point, um, the revelation or the disclosure of something is between nations, not between individuals. So that's too, too broad for what Watsuji is looking for. We're looking to understand the nature of a human being. Right, what it is to exist as a human being. It's, this is primarily a phenomenological investigation. So going into that, uh, extending it that far is, is going further than Watsuji wants to. So the meaning of public existence, as far as Watsuji is concerned, is restricted to the, the, the level of um, nations. And you could even argue, I think, that, that when you get to a certain size, um, perhaps it's more meaningful to talk about public existence within a state, for example, or within even a city, maybe, or a town or a suburb or whatever. Uh, yeah, so there are different ways, different kind of levels of thinking about this. Uh, but what's important is that wherever, whichever level you go to, uh, you have um, revelation taking place between individuals. That's what we want to keep in mind here. So for information or ideas to be revealed or disclosed doesn't mean that everybody knows everything. It just means that everyone who wants to know has access to that information. Um, so that's kind of the meaning of public existence, what, what, what Tsuji is talking about when he talks about this. And the other key word here is communication. So publicity arises through communication, um, which means that there is just a route, a medium for this, for, for whatever it is, information, ideas, uh, whatever to be, to be disseminated across the the subjects within this this broader whole, which is the society, which is the public, which is in which in which we live as which we live in the in the mode of public existence. Perhaps that's the best way to put it. So communication is important. Um, and here he 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 talks about social consciousness then. So you've got this public existence taking place in the society. It's, it is a revelation. It is a disclosure of something and it arises through communication. So we have, in a sense, 
a consciousness here, a social consciousness is the word he uses, which is kind of analogous to an individual's ego consciousness. But we have to be careful with this pushing that analogy too far. Um, and one reason that Watsuji gives here is disclosure in society requires this communication right, between and across individual parts of the, of the whole of, of society. But in an individual mind, contents are directly connected without recourse to publication or communication. So within your own mind, you don't have, your own mind is not fractured into parts. It's not a collection of little individual entities or groups that have to communicate to each other in some way. <clears throat> your mind is fundamentally a whole. It's not, it's not the kind of society that we're talking about here. It's, it's originally and, and, um, completely a, a whole. I mean, you know, you, you don't need to, if you're thinking about a belief that you have versus um, an experience you remember, you're not, information is not being communicated across different parts of your mind. That's, that's kind of not what's, what's really going on there. And that's how it differs, differs from social consciousness, where in a sense, there is something similar. There is a, um, there is a, a whole in, in terms of the society, which we can consider as a whole, um, and the individuals within it are just parts within that whole. Um, but there is, in order for social consciousness to arise public existence, there has to be communication between those parts, those individuals. And that's, that's a fundamental distinction between the two. So he uses the word social consciousness, but just be aware there is, um, there is an analogy to be drawn to a, an ego consciousness, an individual mind, but it can only be pushed so far. You might wonder here then, the way I described it, what about the brain? Right? There are different parts of the brain are connected to other parts through neural pathways or whatever. So do we not have communication taking place in the brain then? And yes, of course we do. But whatever the metaphysics of the situation, the mind is not the brain. We're not going to investigate this question at all. That's like I said, it's a metaphysical discussion, how mind arises from matter or if it even does, or if it's a separate substance or whatever, whatever you want to believe, whatever you believe about that is irrelevant here because we're not doing metaphysics. We're interested in phenomenology. We're, we're looking at uh, the level at which our investigation is pitched is at that level of the mind, which is a whole. The brain may be connected, different parts of the brain are connected, there are, there's communication going on in the brain, but the mind itself, there are, no diff, there are no parts to the mind which need to communicate like this. So that's a really important idea, and we're going to follow this up in the next chapter, communication. One last thing that Watsuji says about this, to communicate <clears throat> means to divide, to communicate something means to divide it across many subjects. And this tells us two things. One, there's no publicity in a single consciousness. So a single consciousness, like I said before, is, is a whole. Uh, there, there's no, we're not communicating anything across different parts across different subjects. A single consciousness is a subject. So that's the first thing. There's, there's no sense in which we can talk about public existence for a single consciousness. <clears throat> and the second thing that this, this tells us is we're going to have to include spatial extendedness in our discussion here. 
If to communicate something means to divide it across many subjects and those subjects are separate, then what we're talking about is space. So space is going to have to play a central role in um, what a human being is. Which we've already touched on a little bit, but um, we're just going to, to drill down further on that idea here. And this means, by the way, that we are going to have an, an analogue of the body in society. So in as much as we have uh, an ego consciousness, which is um, kind of over and above the, the individual body, which is the spatial aspect, if you like, then we're going to have the same kind of thing when we think about so social consciousness. We've got, if we've got the social consciousness, then that's going to have to take place or arise over and above this body of this body of society, if you like. So there is another kind of parallel to be drawn there. And that's what the next chapter is about. But just before we get into that, just one um, final point. So we've, all we've done is talk about public existence. Um, so far, one little thing about private existence is that for the meaning of, of privacy, privacy, private existence, it is just a refusal of disclosure. So it's back to that negation again. Um, privacy, just private existence just means the refusal of public existence. And that's pretty much all that, that Watsuji says about it. It's, it's less important for what we're interested in here. That's what's been focused on by, by most Western philosophy, private existence, the existence of the individual, ego consciousness, everything started from that. Watsuji is bringing the, the focus to the other side of the coin. Um, and, and that's public existence. And so that brings us to the second chapter, chapter 9, which is the spatiality of a human being. All right, so this is, uh, this is a really interesting chapter, actually. Um, I find this, this notion of spatiality kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, let's get into it, see what he says. So spatiality usually ignored or downplayed in Western philosophy. You know, we've got the body versus the mind kind of distinction, dualism, in which the latter is really considered to be the important part. Sometimes body is even a hindrance, right? Think of Plato. We want to we want to uh, go past the the body, the 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 base kind of carnal desires of the body and and the, the trappings of the body and elevate ourselves to whatever, whatever, platonic ideas or whatever. So it has that, 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 that sense with it, right? And the same thing with space and time. So space has been kind of um, ignored as, as this kind of abstract, flattened, um, homogeneous. Every part of space is the same. It's like a grid, Cartesian style, where... Um, what's really important what it, and interesting are the things in it and the things that um, and and then time is, is much more important than that because that's how we experience it's the focus on the ego consciousness the individual the mind so all of that leads to space and the body being diminished largely in the west um, so two good reasons for why this is not going to work for Watsuji. First, we're interested in public existence. And public existence, we've already discussed, is understood as a social body disclosing information through communication. And so all of that means that space is going to be central to public existence. It's just as important as time. So we're going to have to include space at the same level, not, not as a kind of, you know, um, an add-on or something that's, that's less important. 
than than time or than consciousness. Uh, it has to be in there at the at the level of the foundation of human existence. And secondly, we've seen as well that the body, the the physical, spatial aspect of human beings, is itself subjective. Remember that from the first video. The body is is not primarily. Originally, in a phenomenological sense, the body is not a collection of organs or limbs. It's not a physical thing. For us first, it is, it is personality. It is originally subjective in our everyday engagement with, with other bodies or with other things. The experience of our own body is not of a, um, a physical object. It's of it's that by which physical objects appear as physical objects for us. That by which we can manipulate physical objects and, and achieve projects and things. And here's a, a quote to, the, to that effect. When I, as the subject of practice, stands face to face with thou, thou stands face to face with I as the subject of practice. One's physical body exhibits personality in every part and hence lures another's personality in its every motion. So I quite like that. I won't belabor this point. We've, we've talked about it before. The body is fundamentally subjective. What was interesting in that quote is the use of thou, right? Um, so I can't remember if, if Watsuji says it in the book or not, but... Surely it's a reference to Martin Buber, right? <clears throat> um, anyway, so that was kind of cool. Now, the, the kind of spatiality we're interested in here is connected with public existence, publicity. And that means it is therefore not a uniform extendedness, but a dialectical one in which relations such as far and near, wide and narrow are mutually transformed into one another. And this is another nice little quote. Um, so the space that we're talking about, the spatiality we're interested in, is not an abstract, uniform, what I said before, homo uh, homogeneous, really Cartesian, really scientific way of thinking about space. It's not. It's none. None of those. It's not. That's not the kind of space we're interested in. Space is kind of like a background. Um, canvas, if you like, a neutral kind of playing field on which things exist. That's that's a very uh, lifeless kind of way of thinking about space. It's it's abstract. It's uniform. Uniform extendedness. Um, the word that I would use to to describe this is lived space. It's space as we live it from that phenomenological perspective. Um, okay, cool. So it's not this uniform extendedness. The dialect, the use of that word dialectical is interesting as well, right? Bringing in Hegel. Um, so dialectical just means um, kind of movement through uh, an interplay of opposites. So movement from one opposite to another and back and that that's what we have with things like far and near wide and narrow there there are no absolutes there they um, they they change they vary depending on the perspective right so spatiality is something like like i said it's lived it's something we live and experience it's not this neutral grid cartesian grid um, which on which things exist. So that was that was kind of cool, the, the use of dialectical. That is one thing about the book which I which I haven't focused on at all in this video series is Watsuji is so well read and he gives really um, really good summaries of other philosophers' positions before he gives his own. Um, so that, that that's a definite um, plus to the book and, and um, yeah he, he's impressively 
knowledgeable about Western philosophy. Uh, so Watsuji actually calls this kind of spatiality subjective spatiality, which is a nice word. It's not that abstract space, it's this lived space, it's what I call lived space. And it's even what Heidegger talks about this as well in Being and Time. He talks about spatiality using those words like de-distancing, directionality, region, region as a, as a place where something is, something is in its region. Um, so a very kind of engaged way of thinking about space. And Heidegger tied closely to Dasein, of course, but that's reflected in Watsuji's subjectivity, the, the way he ties spatiality to, to the subjective. Um, but the difference is that in Heidegger was mainly restricted to tools, to, to objects that we use, that Dasein uses. Um, whereas Watsuji is looking to, to use that same kind of or apply that same way of thinking to public existence, to our social existence in a way that, that Heidegger never really did, I think. Um, so since subjective spatiality refers to the way we're connected to each other in space through our bodies in this public existence, it is actually nothing. It's, it's, it's actually none other than the betweenness of subjective human beings, which we talked about at the beginning of the book. So betweenness, that idea of the fundamental importance of um, society, that there is, there is this connection which is intrinsic to human existence um, that comes up here when we're discussing space, what space is. And it is just betweenness. It's, it's this idea of betweenness. Which means that space, spatiality, is a basic structural feature of human beings. Ningen, that, that's that word, Japanese word for, well, the word that, that Watsuji uses for human beings. Um, so it's, it's at the core of what it is to be a human being, to exist as a human being. Uh, and spatiality then is deeply intertwined with human relations through communication. So bringing that idea, that, that key concept back in. Communication is, in fact, we could say that spatiality is made up of communication. It's what, it's what, it's the glue which, which makes spatiality possible which makes virtual existence, uh, public existence, possible. And I've got a quote for you here. Since the spatial extendedness of publicity is connected to subjects by means of mental relationships known as communication or news, space is likely to be eliminated by the cessation of communication or news. And so just, just how important communication is, no communication, no space. <clears throat> subjective space, of course, sp subjective spatiality. And so that's what I, what I mean when I say communication is like the glue that holds this together, that holds this public existence, sp subjective spatiality, betweenness, all of those words, those terms can be used here. Um, and given this, we can identify some key elements of subjective spatiality. Watsuji talks about four, intercourse, fellowship, transportation, and communication, communication or news. So those are pretty straightforward, I think. Intercourse, dialogue, right? Speech, fellowship, that, that um, sense of togetherness, the working with other people. That's cool. Communication, we've talked about that a lot. The, the, the transmission of ideas or thoughts. What was interesting was transportation, because that's probably something that you wouldn't have um, put in this, in this category as, as a key element of subject of spatiality. Transportation. But Watsuji holds it to be quite important. And if you think about it, it is important. 
when we're talking about a society uh, and we're talking about spatiality as this the way in which as betweenness the way in which these different parts are connected within the um, the community then transportation turns out to be quite important things that as as um, as commonplace and kind of uninteresting as roads and, and cars and, and um, in Watsuji's day, there was things like post offices and letters and the post office boxes and things like that. You know, um, they, they drive, um, or they preserve, if you like, betweenness. They, they allow betweenness to, to arise here. They, they are what facilitate subject of spatiality and he, he has a nice quote he says correspondence is like a moving road and a road is a still standing correspondence so that's kind of the importance that that this has so so i, I quite like that it's quite it's um it was worth mentioning discussing in a bit more detail transportation um and then finally in the same way that the human body is not primarily a physical thing, facilities for transportation and communication as well are not mere objects. They are subjective. They're, they're in the sense that they're bound up with subjective spatiality, with betweenness. They are not primarily things, objects, they, they, they have a deeper um, sense about them, which we, which is how we see them, which is how we treat them originally when we're, when we're, when we're living with them, when we're dealing with them, we don't see them as blocks of, or, or you know, we don't, we don't see the road as, as a, um, a slab of concrete with some paint on it. We see it as a means of getting from one place to another, facilitating transportation, facilitating communication. Um, so they are subjective then. And Watsuji even says they're subjective in the same sense that the human body is subjective. Um, and here I kind of put the brakes on a little bit. Uh, I don't think I want to go that far. Subjective? Are they subjective in the same sense as that the human body is subjective? I don't think so. They're subjective, yes, definitely. But subjective like a human body? No, I don't think so. The human body is subjective in the sense of a personality. Right. That's that was in the the quote we um, I gave you just at the beginning of this chapter. Um, one's physical body exhibits personality in every part. That's what we mean when we say the body is subjective. But facilities for transportation and communication they they don't exhibit personality from the start. They exhibit this connectedness, this betweenness, um, which which links to, or which is subjective. It's it's entirely subjective, but it's not subjective in the same way that a human body is. I don't think. Um, yeah, from a from, from a phenomenological perspective, we don't see their objectivity originally, but we don't see them as personalities either. And this will come up in just, uh, we'll, we'll revisit this idea soon uh, when we come to talk about objectification. Another point to note here, then, physical space. So when we're talking about uniform extendedness, that abstract Cartesian style um, space as a grid, if you like, is a derived secondary notion that appears only when a human being has negated the betweenness of subject of spatiality. So what's original is <clears throat> that betweenness. And the physical 
abstract sense of space that we have and that, that we tend to think is original is actually derived. What's original is this subject of spatiality. I really like this. And what it, what it means is one consequence, consequence of this is that you can't get homogeneous space, that abstract space, from an isolated individual ego. Rather, it's derived from betweenness. It's deduced through the reciprocity of perspectives or the relativization of positions in which I put myself in the position of another I. So you can't get this space as uniform extendedness, homogeneous, abstract, Cartesian, grid-style space from an isolated ego. It's only possible through social existence. And that betweenness of subject of spatiality is what is originary. That's what's first. Again, from a phenomenolo phenomenological perspective, that's how we are approaching this, right? What it means to be a human. What, what human existence is. Um, so it, it's not this... So it's, I mean, it's anti-scientific, right? But anti-science, not in the sense that science is wrong or the sense that science is bad, but in the same way that Heidegger being in time was, was anti-science and that that's not how we live our lives. That view, that outlook, that way of thinking of things is a derived way. It's derived from what we originally are, which is engaged human beings, that, and, and phenomenology seeks to capture that, that level. Um, so this is, that, that's great. Physical space is a derived secondary notion. And he does something similar with objectification as well. So when we see objects, when we see things as, as mere objects, we talked about the road before, when we see that as just a slab of concrete with some paint on it, that also, Watsuji says, is only possible through subjective spatiality. Um, and that's also good. And that I, I'm fully on board with that. Objectifying things can only be a derivative, secondary um, move by, by us. However, Watsuji does take this one a bit further than I'm comfortable with. To, and this is very much related to what he said about, um, what was it? Facilities for transportation and communication being subjective in the same sense that the human body is subjective. Same kind of thing. So he talks about objects which are originally encountered as thou. And he uses that word again. Um, so... The, and the example he uses, which is an interesting one, he talks about loving trees, if you love trees. And I'm pretty sure, if I remember rightly, that comes from Buber's book as well, um, I and Thou. So, yeah, just another interesting connection. Uh, so loving, if we love trees, what hasn't happened, Watsuji says, is we didn't first encounter the tree as an object then infer an ego in the tree, then apply our relationship to the tree, um, sorry, then apply the same relationship we have to other egos to the relationship I now I have with the, the tree, which I'm inferring is also an ego, then finally loving the tree um, in the same way, if you like. So I, yeah, I, I, I don't think that's right. I don't... If I think about how I encounter um, trees, even if I love them, uh, they're not originally encountered as thou. As that's that's too close to the way I would encounter another human being, another consciousness, and the way I encounter a tree. Even though I don't see it as a mere object first, that is derived. Um, it's not derived from me seeing the tree as a thou, I think. I think that's too strong. 
I think it, we're, we're better with Heidegger's approach here. We see a tree maybe as um, a tool or, or something, a place to get some shade from the sun. Um, we see it as firewood or, you know, that's, that's how, that's our original engagement with the tree. And then we, we objectify it as a secondary step from there. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I encounter objects as thou. I think that's too strong. <clears throat> anyway, that's just my thought. What I do want to leave you with is a, is a quote uh, which I think is, is quite nice and sums up a lot of what we've talked about here. The negation of subjective spatiality, that is, the standpoint of the individual, establishes these sorts of space, by which Watsuji means here homogeneous space, environmental space, space with fixed positions, these kinds of that abstract uniform extendedness. In spite of this, the origin of space lies in the betweenness of, of subjects that contradicts the standpoint of the individual. Then, through the negation of this latter standpoint, perspective disappears and homogeneous space arises. This homogeneous space is the abstraction of subjective space carried to its extreme. Nice. I don't really need to say anything more with that. I think that's a good quote to finish on. Let's hit a summary. So first, public existence. We looked at this. What is the meaning of public existence? For something to be revealed or disclosed. That's the positive um, sense of public existence. Obviously, it is primarily a negation of private existence, but in its we can give it a, a positive formulation, something to be revealed or disclosed. And public existence arises through communication. That was the other key word here, communication. Private existence, we didn't say much about this, but it's just the refusal of disclosure. So emphasizing that negation, which lies at the heart of Watsuji's conception of a human being. Then we looked at the spatiality of a human being. And Watsuji saw this as subjective spatiality. It's the same as betweenness. Um, and I, I call this lived space, but it's, it's space seen as, seen from a phenomenological perspective. How we, how we originally engage with other things, um, before we kind of submit them to rigorous intellectual analysis, if you like. Um, so subjective spatiality, and this is where I disagreed with Watsuji a little bit. I don't think this is subjective in the same way that a human body is subjective. So the elements that make up subjective spatiality are not subjective like a human body, but... Um, yeah, Watsuji and I kind of part ways on that. The key elements that make up this spatiality, subject of spatiality, intercourse, fellowship, transportation, and communication. And uh, the last thing we talked about was the way that subject of spatiality is prior to physical space and objectification. Both of those both of those things arise as derivatives of this more fundamental, original mode of existence, subject of spatiality. And that is where we will finish today. So cool. It was an interesting chapter. I like that. I like the, the, the um, emphasis on spatiality, which I think Watsuji is dead right, has been neglected. Um, and certainly the body has been neglected as well. One of the reasons I liked I liked Bergson so much and Milo Ponti, they really they really um, follow up on on the body in particular in um, in quite a bit of detail. Bergson not so much on space. He is pretty negative about spatiality, but um, but that's another story. Anyway, thanks for watching. Um, I hope that helped, and I'll catch you in the next video.